Hello and welcome to BIA's Leading Local Insights podcast, where we focus on the trends, technologies, and activities driving local media advertising. I'm Leila Chetty, Senior Media Analyst at BIA, and I'm here joined by Timo Yarnal, who's a Senior Digital Products Executive and Technology Entrepreneur, who is the founder of Neutronian and has a dual role as Head of Business Development of Neva.com. With our guest today, we will be discussing trends regarding media privacy and data compliance. First, let me give you a little bit of background about Timur's um, background. So his father, uh, Doan Jujelolo, was a famous academic writer and professor who taught and did public speaking on media psychology in Turkey. Um, carrying on his father's teaching on personal development, Timur persevered in mechanical engineering and co-founded four startup companies focused on data privacy and consumer trust, also including um, one that was acquired by an industry-leading advertising and media valuation company. Also prior to uh, founding Neutronian, uh, Timur was also the Senior Vice President of Digital Advertising and Corporate Development at Comscore after it acquired um, M.Labs, the dot detection company he co-founded. Um, so in the last few years, the need for increased marketing capabilities, uh, efficiency, effective targeting, attribution, and consumer retention have been really the focus of marketers. So without any further ado, let's jump into the dynamics, the functions, um, the implementations of these emerging technologies that make these aspects um, possible. So Timur, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, can you start by telling us more about how you came about launching Neutronian and where the came, name came from? Also, why did you see such a need for um, such a product? Yeah, thank you, Layla. I'm glad to be here. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the, the full background. I think as you, you pointed to, um, my father, who is a uh, national icon in Turkey and a very well-known uh, psychologist and really brought, I think, family psychology and modern psychology to Turkey, really influenced my, my thinking and, and uh, both around entrepreneurship, you know, always encouraged me to take risks, be an entrepreneur um, and to write, you know, so I think that was a thing. So that, you know, that definitely led to my... Uh, both like the left and right side of my brain with engineering, as well as, you know, jumping into the startup world and, and not being able, you know, not being afraid to take risk. And I think um, potentially embracing failure as, as part of the path, as opposed to the end point. And so um, that, you know, led to uh, the, the startup life and I think has influenced, uh, you know, business and, and life overall. And as far as Neutronian, we are a data privacy analytics and uh, data quality scoring platform. So our goal is to be like the S&P or, or Moody's for scoring data privacy and data quality, meaning local audiences that are you know, having ads you know, targeted toward them. We want to make sure that there's a proper you know, global framework in place to make sure that that's the audience that the the marketer expects um, that the audience itself is aware of how they're being tracked and that the the local media uh, platform and provider is protected saying look we've we've followed these standards we followed this framework so we are being transparent and, and are following applicable compliance laws and you know how that came about i think multiple levels one i have a core belief that data privacy is a fundamental right and part of democracy and i think we've seen you know globally the impact of that when those rights are eroded and when they're supported and so that just a really you know personal passion uh, belief for me and then as you mentioned my third startup uh, m.labs labs was acquired by comscore and i ran the audience verification teams at comscore for a number of years and right there, I, I faced firsthand the issue in finding high quality data partners. You know, I mean, everyone would come in saying, hey, we got great data, it's ethical, it's privacy first, it's all first party. And there was no way of measuring it. I mean, we had to dig in and essentially put everyone through an M&A, you know, like a mergers and acquisitions level of vetting before we could find 
was it actually good data? Was it compliant? And in the vast majority of cases, I'd say 80% plus, we would find issues that would have us walk away from the data partner. So certainly my time at Comscore influenced it quite a bit. Um, and then I would say my second company, Broadcast Interactive Media, where I first met uh, BIA and I worked with local platforms across, you know, Gannett, uh, Belo at the time. I think we worked with, you know, hundreds of, of local TV and radio stations. I mean, that very much obviously influenced my thinking uh, to that time, even prior to doing bot detection, but seeing, you know, local faces, faces special challenges and also has special value in terms of the local content generation, the local news reporting. And by and large, that's been discounted, I think, at the broader market. So a lot of what Neutronian is doing is trying to highlight lower volume publishers that are exceptionally high quality um, because the market has moved towards valuing scale only and not valuing that. So in a sense, the market has moved towards viewing everyone as fast food when there are, you know, organic, you know, much higher quality level of content and audiences out there. So all of those things uh, inspired Neutroni and I think something we're still driving towards. That's very interesting. Thanks for giving us some background on it. Uh, what kind of challenges now that Neutronian is like there and, and operating, what kind of challenges that you are seeing today and what are the new trends that you're seeing in MarTech? <clears throat> sure. So Neutronian launched three years ago in March of 2020, the day before the shutdown order was issued in San Francisco for the pandemic. So one massive challenge we faced is just for the first 14 months, um, we weren't able to meet with clients and prospects face to face. So again, this is my fourth startup. I hope to never again launch into the teeth of a pandemic. <laughs> but I'm proud to say, I mean, we have persevered, we have grown, we have fantastic clients and partners that are very committed to the business and to the vision. Um, partners like Double Verify, Share This, um, IOTA. Uh, we recently announced that uh, Dynata as a major survey platform is a client and is a partner, um, Bombora on the B2B side. So, you know, among my startups, these are, this is among the most committed customer base. And my, my co-founder and co-CEO, Lisa, uh, who's based in the Netherlands, um, it, we've, we've persevered, you know, th uh, through this. The other, I say, challenges just besides like the tactical is that data privacy for a long time has faced cynicism and lack of attention, right? So if we rewind 10 to 12 years ago, just like when brand safety first rolled out, right? When 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 websites were, were first faced with, we want to vet your domains to ensure the content is brand safe. Oh, nobody cared. It took a while to get momentum. Um, the analysis was initially manual. Agencies were doing teams of manual vetting of, of domains to see if they were safe for brands. That has now evolved, become standardized, automated. It's gone from basic, you know, binary zero one, is a brand safe or not, to involve very nuanced machine learning and detection systems that can do sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis on pub publisher pages. And so pri data privacy scoring faces those same challenges right now. Like people wonder why does it matter? Is it really important for my brand? Well, you have to do it manually. Does anybody really care, et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna see that same trajectory where, you know, two to three years from now, huge steps forward in automated scoring along with regulatory change, as well as you know, making it part of an opportunity and showing that you know data privacy correlates to actual better performance for marketers. But you know, stepping back, there's still a huge amount of skepticism. Um, I tell the story, which was recently featured in a publication. I, I told it to another editor at CES this year. I was meeting my my first meeting at CES, which is always a little bit of a shock. You know, you come from the holidays and you're at CES, and one of my first meetings was with a major identity platform. I won't name the name, but Everybody knows this platform. I was meeting with six of their executives, five other people in the meeting. Their CEO was out on the call, but their chief product officer looks me in the eye and says, look, this is all baloney anyway. Nobody cares about data privacy. This is all just for show. None of my customers ask about it. And we do it so well that we don't have to worry about it. You know, and I was shocked that he would admit that in front of a meeting, but I turned right back around and said, 
Well, your customers don't ask about it because they don't want to know, right? Like your your whole value proposition is that you're essentially indemnifying them from the risk and you're taking the risk and we know that. So it's no it's no question that they don't ask, but that doesn't help the consumer. Um, so those are the huge challenges that we face on it, but that is changing rapidly. I think with the Sephora fine, with the FTC actions, the recent fine against better help for, for sharing data and definitely in a post row post Dobbs world, you know, privacy means something to a much broader group of people. And there's people who are willing really to fight for that. And we, you know, we're fully supportive of that. I think when, when a consumer, when somebody can be prosecuted for looking for relevant healthcare information, I mean, that's something that needs to be addressed by the ecosystem. And we need to recognize that if we miss target someone, they happen to look at an ad and they can be investigated because of that, something's gone completely off the rails and we have to do a much better job of defining privacy and protection. And that's that's very, very important. Thank you, Timur, that's really great. I think there's a lot of room for that and uh, we definitely need to dig deeper. Um, now, I wanted to change gears a little bit once you mentioned your time at Comscore. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your dot bot detection company, M.Labs? Labs? Yeah, yeah. So M. Labs was was as so many kind of inventions are. It was um, uh, you know, it was, it was born out of necessity, not a value. So my my second company, actually, Broadcast Interactive, was a technology provider and a ad network provider to local media. So we launched as kind of a local version of YouTube with video and helping uh, broadcasters get their video online way before they knew how to monetize that video. And getting that video online, we also realized they really needed help. You know, this is 2011, 2012. Even the idea of a pre-roll or a mid-roll was something we had to explain to people. So we were helping with the advertising side of, of that at, at Broadcast Interactive. And we started seeing really weird traffic patterns emerge, right? So we start, started seeing user behavior that made no sense. Uh, at one point, we actually got a notice from Google that will look like you have bot traffic on your site. We had no idea what that meant. So I went out and I found an academic, um, a, a cybersecurity expert at University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I was living at the time. And he looked at the data and said, these are bots. And I said, I've got no idea what that means learned about it quickly and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a existential threat for the ecosystem. And we turned that into an opportunity and launched M.Dot Labs as a bot detection platform. And, you know, fundamentally doing data analytics, you know, you're 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 identifying bots. So you're you're identifying the flip side of humans. And similar to the story I just told about brand safety and, and what's happening with data privacy, you know, we started with a rather simple almost manual process, but you can imagine the way that bot detection works, the way that we did it, which is a very specific type of analytics and data science called anomaly detection, right? We're looking for anomalies in the data that would flag non-human behavior. What uh, it started at, started as, was looking for simple traffic patterns, such as do we see a user with a clearly misconfigured user agent browser string? Do we see a user that appears to be clicking or surfing 24 by 7 all day, every day, clicking at regular intervals, right? So those are very simple flags of bot activity that even a lay person can understand. And then from there, you actually start building up more and more and more um, nuanced and more sophisticated layers of bot detection that take into account different methods and different data streams. And you get to where we have today where once M.Dot Labs was acquired by Comscore, along with Human, which used to be called White Ops, you know, we became part of the MRC standard that defines what IVT is today, invalid traffic. And invalid traffic can be broken into um, general, you know, invalid traffic, which is kind of brute force bot attacks, and then very sophisticated IVT, SIVT, which is more around uh, uh, you know, nuanced, more, more, more targeted pieces that might go after a particular publisher or a particular vertical. So M.Dot Labs is a fantastic experience. It really was my my strongest um, introduction to cybersecurity and kind of that hybrid between security and privacy. And now with my role at Neva, really looking at where generative AI, you know, comes into play. Uh, it was just a fantastic experience. So very grateful for it. And um, 
and yeah, there was a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful team at MDOT Labs. We became the core data science team uh, for Comscore, and and that data and that that group is still the foundational layer of Comscore's activation business, which just got uh, renamed, I think, as Proximic by Comscore, which is wonderful. It's also humorous because we uh, we acquired Proximic back in 2015, so it's interesting to see Comscore. Uh, resurrecting that brand name and and building that whole offering around it. That's very cool. Um, even the whole like um, technology of it and just working there. I remember um, there were a lot of emerging technologies that were adapting. So um, very yeah. interesting to learn more about it. And it is um, very just interesting. And, and just to interject, um, you know, our team came in and said, "Look, this amazing data that Comscore has, and we." We built out the uh, Comscore device graph at the time. This is back in 2015, 2016. And everybody building device graphs. You've got uh, different players that had that. And in terms of privacy and analytics, I, I mean, it's scary. It's scary the the type of data that these companies have. I mean, we found that we could build a device graph that could track an amazing number of people at a very granular level to the point where we're like, oh my gosh, like we need it, we need it. And, and would test it on our own phones and like the location tracking capability and the level of what could be there was relatively mind blowing. So in terms of knowing that there needs to be a data privacy framework and we need to move the on, I mean, that was something we saw firsthand, but I, very careful to follow the rules. I think, you know, Comscore, I would say, is is one of the most careful. And Neutronian actually does not have a commercial relationship with Comscore, but Comscore rates very highly in our reports because they're very buttoned up from a forward-facing standpoint. But yeah, it hammered home. I mean, just the level of data that the walled gardens and even large publisher networks have about the everyday consumer is mind-blowing. And, you know, that data, when it leaks into the bid stream, and becomes available to everyone, including foreign adversaries. Um, when you think about the fact that Index Exchange was based in Moscow up until about 18 months ago, very interesting to think about, right? So talk about data privacy and governance and, and how that impacts, you know, how we view TikTok now, et cetera, et cetera, and, and bitstream usage. These are these are vital democratic issues, and they really impact how Martech is perceived. Absolutely, thanks for giving us a bit more background on it. I mean, it's just fascinating how we're all evolving into that space eventually. Um, um, we, you were just mentioning um, Niva.com, which is your most recent project, um, which is an ad-free, privacy-first search engine. Um, you said it raised eighty million dollar from Sequoia and is making. Uh, big waves into the generative AI space. Can you give us some more background on its capabilities, where you see the pros and cons in AI in this? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so it's a big topic. Um, I think the gist, the 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 gist of it is that as I've moved to a co CEO role at Neutronian, partially that's because I believe that the changes in search capability and generative AI does hold the key to what's going to allow Neutronian to, to scale and search and discern, you know, privacy practices, et cetera. Because we are, we are analyzing and crawling publishers all the time. And then here you have Neva, which is literally a search engine, a crawling engine that's got incredible capability. So there's a clear tie between Neutronian and Neva from a vision standpoint that I see. So I'm very comfortable with both. But yeah, Neva is a high powered AI ML team that has raised 80 million from Sequoia. Amazing technology. You can use the search engine right now on Neva.com. You can download the apps, both Android and iOS. And it's amazing to realize there is a private alternative to Google and even to DuckDuckGo. You know, DuckDuckGo talks about being private, but they monetize everything through Microsoft ads and they show ad results before they show actual real search results. Whereas Neva is all about the user, it's all about answers and not ads. <clears throat> and generative AI, which is, you know, the simple version of generative AI is in search, we're not just going to do links back, but like ChatGPT, when we put in a user query, 
when Eva goes out, crawls multiple sites and actually comes back with an answer, it's really mind blowing to to think about that that capability. And I'm sure many people listening to the show have already experimented with ChatGPT. Amazing power, incredible risk as well for false answers, for what are called hallucinations, um, for misinformation to be spread. So one of the things I'm very proud and passionate about is that Neva has already you know, focused on user privacy, has focused on generative AI, but has already proactively inserted publisher, local media, any type of media has actually inserted citations into our generative AI results so that a user can see where the answers are created from, you know, one, two or three, four sources and can verify for themselves, you know, are those sources trustworthy? We're not just going to come back with a general answer. We're going to tell you where it came from. So to me, the the potential for publisher partnerships, uh, we will be reaching out to local media partners um, very aggressively soon to partner with Neva uh, to use our APIs. We think we can enable this type of search experience within sites, which is going to be very at exciting to marketers, advertisers, you know, national and local, and as well as hopefully, you know, uh, local viewers and, and readers. And so, yeah, that's what Neva is about. I think, you know, think of Neva as really as a as a an amazing AI ML lab that has yet to um, really broaden the commercial applications beyond a direct to consumer approach. But my role with Neva is to create the the industry partnerships with publishers, with enterprise, and data, and and grow it that way. So it's it's a wonderful fit. I'm I'm very uh, excited and happy to be uh, to be part of that team as well. And how does uh, Neva identify and manage risk versus, let's say, the performance of AI in its search engine? There's there's a ton of methods that we do on that. I mean, we're using um, you know, co-validation of of other results. We're you know constantly taking our own sources to use as baseline sets. Make sure we're on target. We are reaching out to other companies that are building and are testing our own um, large language models. So you may have heard this incredible change in search is all underpinning this is is underpinned by this change in the actual model, what you come back with is called large language models or LLMs. And the explosion in AI capability has allowed for these LLMs to become so much more powerful, uh, to, to, to check for a wider array of potential results. And I think as far as risk and misinformation checking, you know, the main thing is to in integrate with a wide variety of, of sources that we believe we can know and trust as well as to to make it apparent to the user that they're also responsible for that and that they can uh, be be part of it. And so if you go to Neva right now, there's both citations in the answers, but one of the greatest things that we have is actually something called a bias buster where a user can actually toggle sources. And if they want to see what a left leaning source says, they can toggle to the left. If they want to see what a right leaning source and see the difference, they can toggle to that. So again, I'm very proud of being transparent about that risk, and I think that's a that's an important step. Thank you, Tamor. Um, that's really cool. Um, and I've got only one more question. Where do you see the ad world going um, in your own perspective, um, especially in terms of um, digital channels targeting local consumers? Now, I know AI brings a new level to innovation to the space like we just talked about, and privacy is going to be an issue going forward mm -hmm. in terms of first park data and targeting. Uh, fraud will also continue to be an issue. What are the most important opportunities for improving local media and ad markets? Yeah, so I think there's probably four major overlapping trends that I'd point to right away for local. One, I believe strongly that privacy is not for just a few people. I mean, I, it can be dismissed as only a you know, few people care about it. I, I think privacy is now mainstream. It's here to stay. We see that based on Apple has pivoted its entire marketing message around privacy. And so when the most valuable company on the planet takes that stance, I hope people do wake up and pay attention. Although unfortunately, far too many are dismissing it merely as a marketing tactic. But privacy and 
showing that users and viewers can have their, their privacy choices honored, I think is, is very important. Secondly, the, uh, uh, the importance of local journalism and the awareness of misinformation and the damage that can do is also a very strong, uh, strong trend. For advertising to engage with that, then the changes in identity, right? So the, 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 the issue of cookie deprecation and just where does identity come from will continue to be a massive uh, trend. And that's where this concept of publisher first party data, I think it's well known, but every local media site and property should be thinking about how do they get their users to engage and how can they transparently take in, you know, first party data that they're going to be responsible stewards of and use that to build, you know, really good ad experience. And then the fourth trend then is generative AI, right? So in terms of that engagement, how are, how are people going to engage with your site in this new world, this new manner? Are they all just going to go to chat GPT? Our view at Neva is that generative AI needs to be much more like an Iron Man suit for local reporters and not a destructive force, right? So we want it to be an enhancement. Let's call it a, a bionic man or a bionic woman. And I think that trend is, is very important. So those are my those are my trends. I'd love to follow up more. I think we could talk for days and days, right? But I, I really appreciate you having me on. And I look forward to uh, working with BIA quite a bit more and just really appreciate you uh, uh, taking the time to learn. Thank you so much, Tamar. We really learned so much about it, and we're probably going to dig more into the subject going forward. And um, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate you coming in here. Um, to our listeners, we, if you are BA Advantage client, we encourage you to go into Advantage and check your local market and for local business opportunities. Please let us know if you have any questions, and our team is here to help. Send us an email at infobia.com, and we will get back to you right away. And finally, for everyone out there listening, thank you for joining us for this edition of BIA's Leading Local Insights podcast. It was a pleasure talking to you two more today, and we will continue covering trends in MarTech and AI as this space continues to evolve and grow in so many different ways. So stay tuned and have a good day, and we'll see you on the next episode.